I've just hit record. So in this tutorial, the idea is to um, uh, discuss some of the more challenging problems. So I'm happy to um, get your suggestions or um, you know, if you have something that you'd like me to talk about uh, in particular, then just let me know. Um, what I thought we could do was start with some of the harder algebra questions and then move over to some of the calculus questions. One of the, the most challenging uh, questions this week are the, the epsilon m limit type questions. So I, I thought we could discuss some of those. But of course, I am happy to hear your thoughts and your suggestions. So let me get the ball rolling. I'll start. And um, you can direct me and guide me. So this is the um, algebra course pack. And there's a few, you know, there's a few H questions here. So I thought we could discuss those. Um, and yeah, there's, the, you know, we can, we can do those together. That's not a problem. Are there any H's over here? No. All right. Remember the X questions are for math 1141 only. Okay, so don't worry about the X questions. All right, so um, let's have a look at this, this question here. Um, it, it looks difficult. The, the only thing that, that is really difficult about this is um, understanding where this fourth point D can lie. Okay, so um, there, there are three options there. So let me um let me show you what what we can do there, and um, I'll go go over to my document camera. So let me know what's happening in the chat. Let me know. All right. So um, the the question is number twenty one. So let's consider, please, the following um, four points. So you've got A, which is here, B here, C here, uh, yep, and let's put, let's make D, X, Y, and Z. So we're in three dimensional space here. And what we want to do is find the coordinates or the position for D such that this thing is a parallelogram. Okay. So th th there's lots of different ways to do it. So one way, let's say A, uh, C, um, let's say B's here. Okay, so let's say this is what it looks like. Yep. Now, the third, uh, the fourth point, D, can lie either, say, here. It could lie here, or it could lie over here. Okay, so there's three different kinds of parallelograms that you can get. If the point D is here, then that's it. If the point D is up here, then you would have it like that. And if the point D is over here, then it would be like that. Okay. So this is just one example. But there are two other cases that you can consider. So I'll, I'll just do, do this case, but you can do the other cases. All right. Um, just knowing that there are three parallelograms po that are possible is very powerful. Okay. All right. So let's discover what kind of conditions we have. Parallelogram. We want the two pairs of opposite sides to be equal, basically, like they're parallel and they have the same length. Okay, so we want these things 
to be equal. Okay, so if D is unknown, who can tell me what is the relationship then between AD and CB? Can anyone tell me in the chat what, what is the relationship between the vector AD and the vector CB? Let me know you're alive out there, people. Let me know what is the relationship that or the equation that we want to solve. Who can tell me? Anna, Kevin, Jordan. Hello. So Kevin and Jordan, you're correct. They're both parallel. And because it's a, we want a parallelogram, they'll actually be equal in length as well. Okay. So the opposite sides are parallel and they're actually equal in length. Okay, so yeah, you Yun, that's a good good thing. And in, in fact, you you want the k to be equal to one, right? With this setup, you want that vector to be equal to that vector. Okay. So we want them to equal in length. So let's solve it. Oops. Uh, AD equals CB. So the direction is the same, the length is the same, and we'll find our coordinates from that. So the vector from A to D, it's going to be that position vector minus that position vector. So X minus negative 1, Y minus 3, and Z minus 4. Now, that's a 3, that's a Z. Okay, don't confuse them. I put little tails on my Z. Okay, so uh, now we want CB. So that minus that. Uh, let me just check something, 463. So, yep. So that minus that. So 4 minus negative 1 will be 5. 6 minus 3. Oh, oh, sorry, hang on. I'm doing the wrong one. That minus that. Okay, sorry. Okay, 4 minus negative 1 will give you 5. 6 minus negative 2. Six minus negative two will give you four, and three minus one will give you um, two. Okay, so now all we want to do is solve this for x, y, and z. Okay, so d, so x is going to be something like a negative four. Uh, y is going to be 7, and z is going to be something like 6. Okay. So there we go. Now remember, when you solve these kinds of vector equations, it's just like a system of equations, a linear system. You just solve in the component-wise fashion. Okay. Okay. So uh, is X positive? Oh, yeah, positive 4. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Good spotting. Yeah, positive 4. So don't make the mistake like I did. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so there are, three, there are three other cases. I won't do them. They're similar. So in that case, you would have D up there or D over there, and you would just draw a new uh, parallelogram and um, you would just, you know, have different, slightly different vectors here. Okay. All right. So that's, um, that's a H question, but I don't think it's, it's super difficult. 
um, once you know how to do it. Okay. All right. So let's have a look at another one. Question 22 is very similar, but you don't have um, particular points. Okay, so with this one, um, drawing a picture is super important. Again, three points with position or coordinate vectors. Um, and you want to add an extra point to form a parallelogram. Calculate vector expressions for these points. So, so it's it's very similar to the previous example, but it's slightly general, more general because we don't actually know the the positions. Uh, I did talk about this in the Monday tutorial quickly, but I can spend a little bit more time on it now. Okay. So Joseph, H means hard, R means standard or routine, V means there's a video solution, okay? So if you, if you look up here, there you go, that's, that's the legend. You got it, Joseph? You should be able to see that in your, in your course pack, okay? All right, so for me, the, um, the key with 22 is to draw a picture, okay? So let's draw a picture and see what happens. Okay, all right. So um, what have we got? We've got D, E, and F. All right. So let's go D, E, F, and we'll put the, the fourth point there, okay? So D, E, F, and this is only one of the solutions, right? There's three different cases to consider, but I'll only do one of them, okay? And this can be our fourth point, X, okay? And let's put in the origin, say, here, okay? So... What I would like is to compute that vector there, okay? Because once I know the, the position vector, then I know its coordinates. Okay, and we want this to be a parallelogram. Okay, so obviously these are parallel and the opposite sides are equal. Okay, so um, um, let's say uh, we want DE to be equal to XF and we want EF to be equal to dx okay so it, it, this is much easier than it looks um, what we want to do is go from here to here but we actually don't know what this is we know this point this point and this point so what that means is we can compute that vector that vector that vector okay so who can tell me how can i get from zero or the origin to x by adding or, or subtracting vectors? Who can tell me in the chat? Anyone? Who can tell me? Right, I know. Yeah, Doha, that's a, that's a great suggestion. I can go from here to here and then over here to here. But I'm, 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 I don't know what, what x is. So can I write dx in terms of another vector? It's a good, it's a good question. Yeah, ef, right? 
Absolutely right. Thank you, Doha, Naomi, Brendan, and Anna. So in this picture, what I can do, I can go from here to here, and then I want to go over here. I don't know what this is, but I know it's the same vector as this, right? So so let's use your ideas. Now, dx has the same direction and the same length as EF. Okay. Now, what who can tell me on the chat, what is the, in terms of the position vectors, E and F, how can we write this? All right, so this is like, that's the position vector, that's the position vector, that's the position vector. Yeah, Anna, thank you. So we can go bloop plus that minus that. And that's it. Okay, great job, people, great job. So this really wasn't a difficult um, exercise. Drawing a picture helped and then realizing, well, what, what do the opposite sides of a parallelogram satisfy? And some people, they freak out. They, they, they get really angry because they go, dx is not the same as ef, but, but, but it is because they have the same length and the same direction. Okay? So, some people freak out. They say, Chris, the vectors are joining two different sets of points. They're not the same. They are the same, okay? Because the two vectors have the same length and the same direction. That, that's, that's what we mean when we say two vectors are equal, okay? All right, so you can do the other two cases for that, okay? So... B and uh, uh, the other two cases, the other, uh, sorry, the other expressions for the two, for the other two points are, are very similar. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. I might do another. Oh, yeah. Let's do one of these. Let's do 29. Okay. So 29 is an interesting um interesting question because it talks about things in four-dimensional space okay so what I think what they're trying to get you to do there is to understand what's happening in three-dimensional space and work out some diagonals and then try to work out what happens in four-dimensional space now four-dimensional space you can't you can't visualize it, right? Like it's 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 really hard to visualize. So let's try to use the three-dimensional space and see see what happens. All right. All right. So we've got something like this. Uh, this is 29. Okay. And each of these have length 1. All right. So we can actually draw the basic um, position vectors. Okay. So this might be um, your i vector okay and what they're trying to do is to get you to compute the um the the length from say here to here and then from here up to here 
Okay. So um, let, let's just take this point here. This this will be the point one one one. Okay. So let's work out the distance from here to here. Okay, that's a pretty easy way to do it. Or you could do it from here to here or whatever. Okay, so the distance from to, I don't, I'll just go down to that one. Okay, um, we can work that out from Pythagoras' theorem, right? So let's um, uh, let's work that out. So it's going to be so it's one minus one squared. So that's zero, and we're going to get square root of two. So that that's what they mean when they talk about you know the distance from there to there along a face, or from there to there, there to there. Okay. And so now what they want us to do is to work out the distance from the origin to this point here. Okay. So that's root two. We want that distance, and this is one here, of course. Okay, so the distance from, say, one, one, one to the origin, that's the origin there, that's just going to be Okay. All right. So you can see what we really did there was we said, okay, we've got three basis vectors, i, j, and k. So that, that would be i, that would be j, and that would be k. Okay, and using those vectors, just adding them together, we can get to every corner on the cube. Okay, so there are basis vectors in um, in three dimensional space. Now with four dimensional space, it gets a bit crazy. So let's let's have a look at four dimensional space and see what see what we can what we can do. Okay, so this is by no means an easy concept or an easy idea to grasp all right so instead of these being our basis vectors so when when we say basis vectors we mean the little building blocks of the space or the set uh, so we're going to have one zero 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 one zero zero. I'm getting a bit binary now. Zero zero one zero and zero 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 one. Okay, so there's four of them. Okay, now you can look at all the different combinations of these to get to the corners on your on your four dimensional cube. Okay, we're getting a bit meta, but you can kind of see how many vertices you're gonna get, right? Because each entry is either a zero or a one. Okay, so the number of vertices for our three dimensional cube, well, you've got, this is gonna be zero or one and there's three entries, right? So it's two, to the power three, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. In this case, you've got either zeros or ones in each of the entries. The vertices are going to be equal, not 
two to the power three, but two to the power four. Because there's four parts and they're each either zero or one. Okay, so going back to our question. How many vertices does a four cube have? 16. It has 16. Okay. And what will the diagonals be? Well, you can repeat the same process from the previous um, uh, three-dimensional space. You're just looking at the distances between the corners, right? So um, let me let me just show you how to do that quickly, and then I'll move on to a different a different question. So the distance between, say, the point associated with that and that, that's obviously going to be root 2, right? And if you added that plus that plus that and you work out the distance to the origin, the length is going to be root 3. If you add that and that and that and that, you know, similar to what we did up here, the distance to the origin would be 2, okay? So that, that's a pretty interesting question because it, it's trying to get you to think in higher dimensions where you can't actually see it in your mind, okay? Um, who can tell me on the chat how many vertices does a five cube have? Who, who can tell me on the chat how many vertices does a five cube have? Yes, 32. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So um, I can't imagine something like that, but um, they do exist, right? They do exist. Okay. Shall we do some calculus questions? Let's do them. Okay. So if you have anything else you want me to work on, then hit me up in the chat okay hit me up in the chat all right so um what i thought we could do is is just do a routine one um students find these these questions very difficult okay they find they find this part very difficult okay so i thought we could discuss that and maybe i'll look at some some h questions like uh like like this one okay but let's let's try this other one first yep yeah. all right R write down the formal definition of this epsilon and m's evaluate this verify from the formal de definition okay so what do people think is, is would you would you class this as a challenging question? Okay, so is it, I'm going to say, is it easy or not? Um, so, some students find it easy, not many though, not many students. So let me write some notes and we can do it together. Okay. So this is question four from the calculus. Okay, so write down the formal definition of the statement. Well, here it is from lectures, right? Let L be some number and let F be a function. If for every positive value of epsilon, there's a number m such that this distance is small when x is big enough then that's what we mean when we say the limit of the function equals this number l okay so and the challenge is to find or construct uh, an m that works for every positive epsilon so this distance this is a distance here it's usually small when x is large enough so how how large does x need to be for this to work for every epsilon Okay, so that, that's, that's what I did in lectures. Um, so so 
So I'll just say see the lecture notes for that. Um, part B. Who can tell me on the chat what is the actual value of the limit? Who can tell me? Who can tell me on the chat? Ben says one half, Yuyun zero, Joseph zero. So let's have a look. So the first thing is the, the numerator doesn't change and the denominator gets large and positive as X gets large and positive. So this thing is going to drag the numerator down. So let's have a look at GeoGebra, see what we can see. Okay, so... Okay, it looks like the function, as we go off to positive infinity, it looks like the function is approaching zero quite quickly. Okay. So if I was um, doing this question, what I would do is I would recognise that this is just zero. Okay. So that'll be our value for L in, in the third part. Okay, so um, let's let's do it. Let's see if we can prove this from the definition. So this is our function. Okay, so there's a there's a definite method with these problems. Um, one way is to start with this. Simplify and then solve an inequality to get your m. Okay, so so let's have a look. So we want to know when is this small? How big does x need to be? Or what? what how, like, how can I choose x big enough for this to be small? Okay, so. That's your L, that's your F. What we want to do now is simplify, okay? So how do we simplify this? By removing the absolute values, okay? So the goal now is to simplify. Okay, obviously the zero is not going to change it. And I can take the absolute values away because one is positive, two x squared is positive. Ba -ba! Okay. And so I've simplified as much as I can. Let's make this smaller than epsilon. Okay. So how do I know that's true? Well, let's bring the x squared up there and the epsilon down there. Okay, but we don't want x squared bigger than that. We just want x. Well, let's go with... So we'll solve this and we'll say that it's bigger than zero. Okay, the reason I'm taking it bigger than zero is because we don't need to worry about whether x is positive or negative here. Okay. So this is going to be your M. Okay, that's going to be, again, greater than zero. 
Okay, so that's it. So the idea was to see some students, they, they're not sure when they finish this problem, right? But what, what are we chasing here? We're chasing an M. So we want to find or construct an M that works for every epsilon. Okay, so if you give me a value of epsilon, I can always find a value of M such that this is true. Okay, now don't worry too much if this looks very strange to you. Um, mathematicians took a long time to really get these ideas together and, and, and understand them. And it's one of the hardest things in this course uh, to understand. Um, you know, you've seen limits before probably at high school, but this is very, very um, formal and, and very, um, you know, some people find it very, very difficult and it's, it's, it's very abstract, okay? All right, um, questions? Let me know if you have questions on the chat. Everyone's pretty quiet. Are you alive out there? You know, okay. I always get worried when people don't ask questions because people are like sleeping or doing other stuff, right? Okay. All right. So that's one question. Let's do another one. Um, yes, okay, let's do another one. Thanks, Oliver. So let me share this one with you. Discuss the limiting behavior of cos one on x as x approaches zero. So I'll give you a picture with GeoGebra and then we can do it um, more formally. So this is question 15. So let me just make some notes here. Okay. All right. So let me show you my document camera. this is what we are exploring okay so let's let what does this what does this look like in geogebra well i am glad you asked i'm glad you asked all right back to geogebra bop, bop, bop. oh whoa okay what is happening the graph is getting super busy but what is happening so um it doesn't look like the the graph uh, the limit exists it just sort of oscillates in a crazy manner but um what we can do is make a substitution and consider this in a slightly different form okay so let's do that algebraically and i'll show you what happens okay so i'm going to let u equal one on x so as uh, x approaches zero so basically this is one on x right so as x approaches zero we have well um uh let's just go and do it from let me just go back here um if we come in here right one on x is approaching infinity. That'll that'll be enough for us to, to, to get started with. We don't really need to worry about the left-hand limit, but you can do it if you want to. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, do this separately. So let's 
let's um, consider this thing. So, so U is going to go to infinity and we are looking at cosine U. All right. So now it's like, well, to sort of understand that limit, we're going to look at this limit first and see what happens. So who can tell me what is this limit in the chat? Who can tell me? Who can tell me? Come on. Don't be shy now. Doha Oliver saying one. Kevin says does not exist. Ah, but remember Doha, we're approaching infinity here. We're not approaching zero, right? Hmm. So Kevin, I think you're yeah, Kevin and Aichin, I think you're 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 spot on there. You're correct. So let me just show you with GeoGebra. So here's the cosine function, and you can see the cosine function just oscillates between positive one and negative one. So no matter how far we go out with large values of x, it's impossible to get a limit. Okay, so this limit, yes, you unit, exactly. So it vibrates and it never settles down. So, but this limit does not exist. So if this is part of that and this doesn't exist, there's no way that this can exist. Okay, there's, there's absolutely no way. Because this doesn't exist, this cannot exist. All right, so one of the, the nice things there, we just used uh, like a substitution and we looked at one of the limits, okay? We just looked at one of the limits. Okay. Let's do one more question. Okay, let's do one more question. So, I'll do one more on with these limit questions. Okay. So this is a routine question, but we've run out of hard questions. So I thought we could do this one. Okay. So let me just show you this with GeoGebra and um, we can um, see if we can understand it just using a picture. Okay. All right. So let me go over to GeoGebra and I'm going to, um, what is it? X, X squared minus four over X minus two. So let me share this with you in a second. Uh, was it x, uh, was x squared minus or oh, minus four? Okay. Okay. So let me share my GeoGebra with you again. So this is an example like we saw in lectures today, very similar. Okay. And the question is. Is this function continuous 
at x equals 2. Okay, so I'm going to ask the chat, is this function continuous at x equals 2? Who can tell me? Jordan says no. Doha says yes. Joseph says no. Billy says no. Okay. So it's not continuous. But who can tell me, what, why, why is it not continuous? If you wanted to explain that to someone, what reasons would you give? How can we justify that that's really not continuous at, uh, at x equals 2? What might you write in the chat? So sure, um, right, so, so you're right, it's definitely not continuous, it's not defined at x equals 2, which is what uh, Ben has said, and um, Kevin has said the left-hand limit is not equal to the right-hand limit. So here's the left-hand limit, the graph is approaching negative 4. Up here, the right-hand limit, the graph is approaching positive 4. So the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are not equal. Yes, Naomi, I, I agree with what you've written too. So there are some problems. The left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are not equal. And in fact, the function is not even defined at x equals 2. So there's, no, there's absolutely no way that we can you know, make it continuous without doing something drastic uh, to the function. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what what I like to do when I get a question like this is to draw a picture, and you know sometimes I'll just use my pen and pencil to do it, but um, it's much easier with something like GeoGebra. Okay, much easier, or Maple even, or um, you know maybe you've got a graphics calculator that you're using. Um, it's okay to use graphics calculators. Um, in the final exams and, and the lab tests. Um, so, you know, you can, you can use those. Um, whereas five years ago, nobody was using these sorts of things for tests. You had to, you had to like draw it with everything. Um, all right, folks, that's enough for today. What questions do you have? Anything about the course or assessment? Um, somebody, somebody asked, yeah, about calculators. So, so calculators, you can use graphics calculators, not a problem. Um, other people have been emailing me their questions, that's fine, but you'll get a faster response if you post the, the questions in the Moodle forum. So let me, let me show you. Um, yeah, let me, hang on, let me see where, where I'm at. Um, um, yeah, so if I share this with you, let me just share this. So you can see here, somebody has asked an anonymous question about this. Can I have some help, you know, doing what this, so this is a function that is an even function. Okay, and you can see people quickly re reply, okay? So if you want a fast re fast response to your question, it's better if you put it in, in the, um, the Moodle because it's just, it, you know, there's plenty of tutors to help you and other students might help you as well. Yeah, Brendan, it's a good question. Um, yeah, oh, so actually, Aichen, let, let, let's look at you. Yes, no, a, a normal calculator will not be fine, Aichen. You, you, you must use Maple in the final exam and in lab test two. You will absolutely need Maple. You won't be able to do the questions without Maple, okay? So um, lab test one, I don't think you need it, but lab test two and the final exam, you absolutely need it. Uh, Brendan, what's the difference between pre-recorded lectures and live? 
because in Mobius, one of the lessons are for content for the next week for pre-recorded. Um, the pre-recorded lectures are just, um, they can help you with Mobius. Uh, and there's also other ones. Let me see if I can find them. Um, let me just go back here because they might be. Okay, so let me just go back. See what I can find. So um, let's have a look. So that's ours. That that's the live lectures, and here's the pre-recorded lectures. So you can look at those if you want to. It's up to you. Okay, you can download them if you want to. But one of the strange things, Brendan, is that sometimes the the content doesn't quite match between Mobius and the live lectures. Okay, so people were asking me last week, oh, why, why are we doing Epsilon M questions? We haven't done that in lectures. Well, they're, they're trying to get you to prepare for, for um, the, the stuff in lectures. So it's a little bit of a mismatch, but it's never usually anything super serious. Okay, I hope that, hope that um, helps. Right. Uh, just to remind everybody, the week one Mobius has been pushed back. You can still um, you can still submit it up till Monday 1 p.m. But most I think most people have submitted it. Naomi, what is the best way to prepare for lab tests? Great question. You will get some practice exams for the lab tests. So every term, students get some practice exams for the lab tests, and you just do the practice questions and the the real questions are very, very similar. There's no surprises in the lab tests. So just wait, some lab tests from practice lab tests will be released and you just you just do them because um, um, they're the best way to prepare for the lab tests. All right, folks, I think that is it. Namaste, greetings of the day, enjoy um, the day, whatever you're doing. Uh, Kevin, um, some of them are marked by computers, some of them are marked by people. If it's like a proof, if you're asked to do a proof or something and it requires text and words and stuff, it'll be marked by a person. So it's a combination of both. Um, so enjoy. Um, uh, see you at four o'clock. I have another tutorial at four. If not, See you tomorrow for the calculus lecture on a Friday. So have a great day. Thanks, Oliver, Ben, Joseph, Kevin, Kevin, Shakira, Jordan, Brendan. Have a good one, Yanni. Bye. All right. See everyone. Junsheng. Hello. Goodbye. Naomi. 886. Bye bye. Thank you, Yu Tong. Bye-bye, Yu Yun.